community. So thank you, Diana. Thank you. Can you hear at the back? Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about Henderson and beyond, and um, um, I'll first of all look at whether Northfield influenced the Henderson, since the conference is uh, Northfield revisited, um, and then go on to talk about uh, group analysis in the Henderson, and then look at uh, and beyond. So uh, the therapeutic community that became Henderson Hospital, actually all the Henderson, started out as a 100-bedded uh, industrial neurosis unit, uh, part of the larger Belmont Hospital at Sutton, Surrey, um, south of London, in April 1947. And it was under the direction of Maxwell Jones. And Jones had not been part of the Northfield experiments. Um, he had been at the Maudsley, uh, when it was evacuated in 1940 to two sites on the periphery of London. And he was put in charge of a, a unit uh, treating cardiac neurosis or Effort syndrome by psychological and sociological means at Mill Hill School, which had it, itself been evacuated. And due to the common nature of the soldier's complaint, he saw it as logical that they should be treated as a group and each day they had daily meetings of 100 men and all the staff in which they explained the mechanism their symptoms, which were due mainly to muscle tension rather than heart disease. So it was quite a, a psychoeducational uh, uh, process. And um, Jones' style was at least initially quite didactic, uh, not maybe what we would uh, think of as a therapeutic community uh, at the moment, but there are uh, nurses and soldiers and uh, um, Sorry, other doctors, some of whom I think I think uh, look less than interested. <laughs> yes. um, but he learned that the more senior patients were a valuable resource in explaining the symptoms to the newcomers. Um, and he later described how the five years at Mill Hill had opened his eyes to the power of the patient group in treatment. Staff and patients worked together more collaboratively than was traditional, um, in a similar way to how Tom described it at Northfield. And Jones, he wasn't recruited into the army, but his task was to get the men back into army service. In 1945, he continued this way of working, or in fact, uh, before I move on there, there are uh, another couple, of, so this was him um, with, with the, some of the staff there. Um, and then outside would be, uh, <laughs> again, not much that I recognise. <laughs> and, and again, I think this was the social side of things. So. Um, in 1945, he continued this way of working in a unit in Dartford, uh, Kent, which was set up to rehabilitate some of the most disturbed prisoners of war returning from Europe and the Far East. And the excellent results from the unit in returning men to work or training spurred the Ministries of Health, Labour and Pensions to set up the Industrial Neurosis Unit in Belmont, this time for the chronic unemployed people of London. And Jones, as his colleagues, wrote about the unit in 1953 that it was for the specific purpose of studying the problem of adult <coughs> character disorders. Both sexes were admitted, aged between 18 to 60, mainly young adults who came from the poverty areas of London, and they were referred mainly from <coughs> outpatients or the courts. They described the combination of therapeutic, social and work activities as all being important. Included in the therapeutic activities were individual interviews with the doctor, as far as possible weekly, from a few minutes to an hour, and this was supportive and aimed at strengthening or modifying the patient's defences and guidance. But also anything that had been happening on the unit or on the ward was also brought in in, the, in here and now. There are also therapy groups meeting two to four times weekly. And he described the technique in the groups varying considerably with the personality and outlook of the different doctors. However, the content of the groups was often influenced by what had happened in the daily community meeting beforehand which was for the whole community and often in, involved psychodrama. One of the stated aims of the experiment at the industrial neurosis unit was to decide on the most suitable job for the patient uh, when, he, when they returned, um, uh, when they were discharged from the hospital. And a typical day had two two-hour work sessions 
and the work was something which needed to be meaningful for the hospital so that um, it, it gave them a sense of self-esteem in achieving something. Joan was also liaised with local external community and he had 30 employers who employed patients on an unpaid basis. The third component of the programme, the social activities, was seen as important as the occupational. <coughs> and Jones had specifically introduced the role of the social therapist. These were young women from various countries who would stay to six, for six to 12 months. And he felt that their backgrounds, commonly in social sciences, made them less prejudicial than those with a medical training, which is interesting. Um, employing 11 social therapists uh, um, with just three senior nurses. The social therapist would observe the patients and encourage them to try out different possibilities in social situations, including partnering them in dances. And they, they, they were very much involved in the activities with, with the patients. And they met with the doctors daily for tutorials involving discussion of the patients. And they had their own therapeutic group meeting weekly to learn something about group dynamics. In an undated paper titled just Henderson Hospital, and the last reference cited was 1979, so it was obviously written after 1980 or later, Jones wrote that when he was at Millfield, they were only marginally con uh, conscious of, of, when he was at Millfield, he was only marginally conscious of Northfield, but their paths didn't cross in any significant way. The marginal consciousness was presumably aided by uh, the contact, which was noted in Tom's book, between Maxwell Jones and people working at Northfield, including Harold Bridger, who visited Mill Hill. But Maxwell Jones, you know, I think may have played it down, or maybe the contact wasn't that much, but there were people who did go from, from one to the other. But the similarities in the work of Northfield and the former Henderson um, were obviously clear in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the social therapy um, and, uh, and the way that the staff, um, there was a much more collaborative approach. Another interesting um, similarity which I, I found interesting was the use of psychodrama, which um, was also mentioned yesterday. Um, and it was actually quite extensive at the Industrial Neurosis Unit um, in a way which um, I didn't sort of hear as much from, from Jones's work as was described in a newspaper article in Illustrated in 1948. And the title of that was The Play's The Cure. Psychodrama is the name for the latest treatment in dealing with nervous breakdowns brought about by wartime and post-war strain. Um, and the article indicated that psychodrama was central to the treatment in both meetings of the whole community and in the smaller groups. And they had, there were some photographs in the, in the paper. Um, and this one, has the, the, oops, sorry. this one has the subtitle, Man on the Phone, there's a phone here, um, is going over his life during war. He's in the Malta gun pit. Enemy aircraft are approaching and someone shouts, there they are. Then there was another photo, which I haven't got here, um, which shows the Beaufort's gun is swung round over his head. And as the enemy aircraft come nearer and nearer, the order is given to fire and the soldier collapses. And then in the third photograph in this uh, article, um, the man at last rises and staggers away. The gun team laughs, just as his comrades did when the scene actually happened. It was this laughter that Jones felt lay behind the, the difficulties of the patient. He thought that his comrades had thought he was a coward. And these uh, dramas would be acted out in front of all the other patients at uh, the Industrial Neurosis Unit. And then everyone would sort of talk about it and put their points of view. And it was a way of working through um, the, the person's trauma. <coughs> And at Northfield, as we heard, psychodrama was also being conducted with the soldiers by um, Fuchs, um, and he had a, a, a Moreno psychodrama stage, Moreno having been considered the founding father of psychodrama. 
but it wasn't clear whether Jones was aware of this at the time. He stated in his 1953 paper that he, he wasn't aware of Moreno when he first started psychodrama uh, nine years previously, but Moreno did visit um, the Henderson on a number of, of occasions later on. So there were, obviously there, were, there was crossover, but it wasn't very clear and it certainly wasn't very direct uh, in the development of, of the Henderson. So although there wasn't a direct link, um, Uh, between Northfield and the Henderson and its development, what about an indirect link with Fuchs through his development of group analysis after the war? So my um, experience um, at the Henderson um, in 1992 for six months as a registrar and then from 1998 as consultant in the newly established outreach service until its closure was that group analysis was part of the fabric of the therapeutic community. And I wondered when the small groups moved from depending on personality and outlook of the doctors, as Jones had described, to a more group analytic approach. In a, a recent, I'll just play some of these uh, as I go. Um, this actually, uh, so this is obviously not a hundred bedded unit. Um, there was a fire at Belmont um, Hospital in 1971, I think it was, um, and they moved into the nurses' um, home, uh, and there was room for 29 residents then, as we called them. So this was the, the premises from the 1970s. Um, in a, a conversation recently with um, Denny Briggs from America, which was set up by Craig Fees at the PET, I don't know if you know the Planned Environment um, Trust, um, uh, Therapeutic Trust. Um, so, so some ex-Henderson uh, staff went there. That's where, our, that's where we've archived the rest of the Henderson material when it closed. Um, Craig set up this conversation with Denny Briggs, which was on a rather poor line, but um, I did manage to ask him a bit about the, the small, the, the doctor's groups, uh, as they were called then. Um, but, and uh, he visited the Henson twice, in the 1950s with Maxwell Jones, and then in 1960s with um, Stuart Whiteley. And he said that uh, initially um, the groups were very much dependent, as, as Jones had said, on who ran them. And I think there was often quite a lot of social, um, just social work going on in the groups um, uh, in both the 1950s and 60s. And it was um, Estella Weldon in her time there from 1964 to 67 who said that the groups were uh, run, still being run by the doctors but her account was very much influ influenced by psychoanalytic theory at that time, which felt as if there'd been some change in the um, intervening period. Marion Collis, a research sociologist, uh, described um, uh, the development of a, a women's group in 1985 um, to 86. And the female group leaders wanted this as a consciousness raising group in the context of the feminist movement of the day whereas the residents actually didn't want that, they wanted it as therapy. But with time, it became a combination of therapy and consciousness raising, each being figural ground, much more akin to um, group analysis. But it seems to be during Stuart Whiteley's time, from 1960, when he first went there um, as a locum, that Fuchs's ideas became more to the fore. Michael Parker, who was a social worker at the Henderson from 1982 to 95, wrote in a personal communication that Stuart was always taken by Fuchs's ideas, especially the 1975 book definition of group psychotherapy as a form of therapy by the group of the group, including its conductor. Stuart spent a lot of time with the Group Analytic Society, and I know uh, many of you will know him, or knew him, um, in various key roles. But what uh, Michael remembered most clearly was his espousal of the concept of creating potential space, a Winnicottian idea, so that residents and staff could both feel safe enough to grow and develop, 
and that their task was to assist this process. And he thought it was always clear that, the st that um, Stuart thought the staff were on a learning curve too and was strikingly helpful to most. And, and many uh, staff did go off and do different trainings, um, um, some more psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, and, 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 and some in group analysis. And uh, Michael thought that um, Fuchs's ideas of putting uh, personally appealed to Stuart, um, and he had a lot of time for what he wrote and referred to him with admiration. And Stuart thought the therapeutic community was really one medium-sized group and could be viewed as functioning as such and was subject to the dynamics such groups typically featured but had little time for wordy interpretation as some staff had the interesting habit of making. <laughs> but the groups were no longer called doctor's groups. Rather, they were just known as the small group, and that's certainly how I, it was when I was there. And there was a great deal of pride in the understanding that the Henderson was democratic, and if, if they had the ability and aptitude, any member of staff could become a trained therapist. Group analysis uh, at the Henderson was obviously adapted and apply, applied group analysis for the particular group that uh, we were treating. Um, and residents and ex-residents in the outreach service, um, they would support each other in between or after groups. So obviously that was very different from the traditional group, analytic group, outpatient group. Um, they were usually two or three staff allocated to each group, although not all would be in at the same time. Some of them, so the social therapists would be in the groups as well, and nurses who would be, but they would be nights on the rotors, so um, wouldn't necessarily be there. But they were run three times a week. And also the staff would be in other groups with the residents in different situations, at tea or playing rounders. So they, uh, the, it wasn't, they were known much more widely to, to, with the residents, um, which lessened the, the transference, I think, which could be uh, actually very difficult sometimes otherwise and quite overwhelming. And we also paid attention to, um, to the anxiety levels, which were very highly, uh, were high in this very distressed patient uh, resident group. So there were obviously um, adaptations that were made um, by the group analysis. Um, also, just to say that uh, it was very much that the therapy groups were just part of the whole therapeutic community. I'm not quite sure how much people know about therapeutic communities here. I know some of you obviously worked in them, um, but others might not have done. Um, and it was very much sort of the, the psychotherapy and the living learning experience, the social therapy and work groups and um, the residents um, would, they would chair the community meetings, they would meet with staff, discuss what was affecting the community most um, the night before and plan the agenda for the meeting the next day and there would be all sorts of different um, roles that they could take on and try out uh, within the community um, starting you know maybe when they just come in um, to sort of making sure there were tea towels and the fish were fed um, although that, you know, that could have caused problems too, we weren't always fed, um, up to um, taking on the most senior roles in the um, staff group, and I've got five minutes left, fine. Okay, so I just wanted to put that in, because it, it's group analysis in, in context. Um, so, and uh, beyond, uh, so there's, there's just the other, there's uh, social therapy and the small group room. Um, so visitors were part of the culture of the Henderson uh, from its earliest days with people staying for a variety of lengths of time and many would take their experiences back to other places of work in the UK and abroad into forensic units such as the Van der Hoven Clinic in Holland uh, to non-forensic mental health settings and to prisons, for example, Grendon, HMP Grendon which opened in 1962 <coughs> and these generally flourished over the next decades and in 1998, the Henderson was funded to set up two new residential therapeutic communities with their outreach teams, one in Crewe and one here. And uh, very <coughs> nice to see Graham, who, was, who worked there, uh, one of the staff who worked at Main House, um, which was actually the isolation hospital I hear uh, this morning from Tom. 
um, in the early 2000s. However, by 2010, all three had closed. And the Henderson <coughs> had faced and survived closures many times over its lifetime. That had other therapeutic communities, um, some not surviving. Some residential units had become day TCs, and other TCs were opening for five, three, or two, or one day a week. And, it, and although there was a, a definite need for non-residential therapeutic communities, the argument that there was no longer a need for residential ones was with the development of more outpatient treatments for people with a barren one when so few services were actually available and when those individuals with the more complex and severe difficulties were taken into account. And uh, this was the reaction of the residents to uh, the meeting where the, the senior... The, um, that, she, she's not a resident, she was a member of staff, but when the... Um, the trust executive came to tell the residents that they were closing the hospital and uh, drew an analogy with Mars bars. If Mars bars were no longer wanted, then they would not be made anymore, which uh, did not go down in a, a, a few very empathic. But it was an empty victory for the Henderson when the outcome in 2010 of the public consultation into whether there was a need for residential services was affirmative, as it had already been closed. However, for those that need treatment, it was at least an acknowledgement of their need. But what's interesting is that therapeutic communities in prisons continue to be supported by their hierarchy. There are 14 therapeutic communities in five prisons in the UK Community of Communities audit cycle for 2017 to 18. And Mark Morris, writing in 1999, when he was medical director of Brendan, said that he felt that in part the longevity of the Grendon experiment might be attributed to the fact that Grendon has not occupied a countercultural position within the prison service, but is very much a prison run by a prison governor, albeit one run as a series of therapeutic communities, and one in which therapy is the core business. This owning of the therapeutic communities by the prison system seems important, as is the continued wish to lock up offenders by society. In contrast, the mental health therapeutic communities were never as securely owned by the different NHS commissioning bodies that came and went over the years and were more subject to the changes in society. In a paper presented to the Windsor Conference, which is the annual conference of therapeutic communities in 2009, the late Martin Wrench, who was a social worker and dear colleague, and I looked at the effect of the changes in society whereby everything is wanted or accessible instantly, and where change is the only constant. And that's drawing on Bauman's concept of liquid modernity. The current language is of well-being and recovery, leaving little room or appetite for complexity, severe distress, ambivalence of feelings and time. With each commissioning change, or indeed individual involved, and, and commissioners changed uh, like the wind, different requirements were made, sometimes contrary to those of their predecessor. I, I'm aware of the time, so I won't sort of um, give you the details, which are actually quite painful anyway, but I, I was going to say a bit more. But I just wanted to say a bit about time. Estella Weldon, in her Fuchs lecture in 1997, Let the Treatment Fit the Crime, was very clear that she felt um, the emphasis had been on short, sharp and shock treatment uh, and that actually time was the key to opening areas of the most primitive defence mechanisms. Also about the culture having changed and that anything that didn't conform caused anxiety to our trust. It's much more market and data driven. Um, uh, just, there are some recent innovations which could be seen as having come out of the TC movement such as pipes, pies, and enabling environments, I won't go into those, um, which all emphasise the importance of relational security. But as um, John Adlam and Chris Scanlon, both ex-Henderson staff, have written eloquently on the demise of the Henderson and other therapeutic milieu, they suggest that the concepts behind this new wine in old bottles were not significantly different from therapeutic communities, but maybe a clear, appeared newer, cleaner, and more modern, and were driven from an imagined top down, and so to seem to sit more comfortably with a, with, with a liquidly modern discourse. I think it's still 
frightening uh, for people or uncomfortable to have really authentic service user involvement and collaboration, however much it's, it's actually said that's what's needed. Mm. I'm going to just say 30 seconds. Um, what I didn't look at was whether Norfield actually influenced current military psychiatry, and it's quite mm. interesting that I don't know if there are any, anyone from military psychiatry here, but I mean, it's interesting that it's not them that are meeting, it's us sort of um, mm. in psychiatry and psychotherapy. Um, and um, I did a very brief sort of look, um, but people might know much more than I do. Um, there was um, a, a sort of halfway house for um, veterans in the Community and Housing Trust, uh, which has since closed. I found there's a veterans group uh, at Grendon, which is a monthly group, um, because they felt that they they didn't, you know, they wanted somewhere to belong with the fellow veterans. There was also a reference to a day TC in Croatia that treats veterans, and also in America. But um, uh, over here, it's mainly, I think, trauma-focused CBT. Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. it may be that other people here, you know, know more about what happens in, in their own countries. But I, I just thought it was maybe an interesting thing to think about. I'd be really interested Hold to. Up the mic. I'd be really interested to know what your, uh, you know, response might be in terms of your experience of the the, the, the clinical value of charisma versus uh, the dangers of it in uh, your experience in therapeutic communities. Because I think I'm, I'm really searching for a postmodern version. <laughs> A, po a postmodern version of charisma. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because um, I, I read uh, somewhere that um, I'm not sure who it was who was went to Millfield to evaluate it and said that uh, they they weren't sure how much it was the model or or the charisma or charismatic nature of of, of Jones, Maxwell Jones, but. Um, yes, uh, a difficult one really, because uh, uh, is that what keeps places um, alive? In which case, I could say, well, what happened to my charisma? <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, there's there's a lot of um, I think the charisma it, it means that it is that person when they leave, the the place doesn't survive. And Henderson did survive after Maxwell Jones left. He was described as charismatic. I'm not sure whether Stuart Whiteley was. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I mean, I liked him a lot, but I wouldn't have said he was a charismatic leader, um, and um, nor, nor the others afterwards. So uh, I would hope that it wasn't just. I don't think you know, uh, a therapeutic community is is meant to be more about the, the democracy, the sort of sharing, the the fact that the staff feel they can you know go and train and. and and run, be in the groups, and they are as important, uh, you know, the staff and whatever grade of, 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 um, of the staff, so. I mean, I think you touched on it when you talked about the, um, the dilemma of service user involvement. You know, that's, that's to me how we transform charisma into something mm -hmm. that's suitable for the society we have now. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a brief director after going before Stuart came. Thank you, remember that. Um, it didn't work, obviously. Well, it was Bob, Bob was the one who said that he that Stuart went to the locum after, um, let's say, he, in one of the email conversations we had, 
that he went to the locum and said he'd got no previous experience of psychiatry or psychotherapy when he went there. Um, which is interesting. Um, yeah, but so he didn't. But there were so he didn't mention another director. No. Not. Thank you, Diana, for your overview. Um, I didn't hear from how many residential therapeutic communities still exist in the UK. Well, in the NHS, there's the Castle. Yes. I think that is that is it in the NHS. That's it. Yes, that that's had to fight for survival too. It's a, a slightly different model from um, yes. the Henderson, but um, yes. a lot of overlap as well. Yes. Yes. They, they have um, individual psychoanalytic treatment as well as the group, which, uh, yeah. But the, you know, yes, the one that was here, Main House and Web House went as well, yeah. What's happened with the Inkerborn Centre, sorry? Tom can uh, tell you about that. <laughs> it closed. Tom, uh, the Inkerborn Centre closed in 2003, uh, and some of the staff Thank you. Well, I just wanted to add that in Israel we have a very developed uh, work, group work, and individual with people, we wouldn't call them veterans, mm. because it's hard to distinguish between active soldiers who may become veterans because they finished their military service because of invalid or something. Um, and we don't have really centers. The whole work is embedded in the society. It's not a place. There are many places. And the people are not called patients. I was looking in the translation how to, to translate entitled. They are called, the closest way is to say entitled. Entitled to help. Mm. And the help is meant to reintegrate them in society, to readjust them in the society. Also for bereaved families and also for invalids. It's a very um, 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 emphasized uh, aspect that they are not called patients. Mm. They are not ill persons although they can be, but they are not called this way. We work with clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, psychiatrists, mental professionals, but the people that we are working with, we are not treating them, although they are therapeutic aspects, but they are called entitled. And but they are all treated, um, they're the same group, I mean, in terms of they're all people who have been in the um, um, armed forces, or they currently are. They're not, are they treated in the same groups as civilians? No. 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 Because I think what's happened over here is that mm. actually uh, they are expected to be treated uh, along with civilians. And, uh, and I hear you know, from, from people in the army that they actually find that very difficult. They don't have that sense of belonging. They don't feel understood. Um, whereas you, you are, they are, you're keeping them together in a sense. So. It's a different cocktail. Yes. They are treated with civilians, by civilians, but as sort of a homogeneous groups. Mm -hmm. It's a yes. different group. Yes. You have to yes. bear in mind that yes. every adult male in Israel yes. goes yes. to military yes. service. Yes. Well, that would be very different. But I think it, here, I think it, it makes people feel very um, isolated. I think the battery's running down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure your voice is large enough okay. to... Can I talk without? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. One of the things I remember Stuart talking about was the collapsible pyramid in relation to, relation to leadership. And he said there were times when the pyramid had to go up, and he had to be at the top and direct things, and there were times when it could come down, and, and you could have a kind of flattened hierarchy. And that seems to me a very interesting model and very important. 
you just think there are times when you have to assert yourself. But the important thing, as I was trying to say yesterday about accountability, <coughs> is that you're subsequently accountable for how you use the power in those moments when you take the pyramid up to dictate what, what's going to happen. And that seems very central to the, the, the whole process. The other thing is this, this strange thing about charisma. Because I'm not quite sure what charisma is. But what I do know is that you do need a strong personality leading a therapeutic community. And Stuart certainly had that, because I saw when he did assert himself. And he was, he was very decisive. And recently, I, I was conducting a group that, a uh, con consultative group, that, that Kevin Healy, the former director of the, of the castle, was in. Kevin could come in and sit down and create a kind of calmness in the group that's been missing ever since he left. So although he, he wasn't sort of an extrovert kind of character, he nevertheless had a very strong and forceful presence when, when he was part of the group. Mike and then Dick. You know, and, and then uh, Dieter, sorry. All, all my work has been in adolescent therapeutic communities or with children. And I, and I suppose one of the things that I've noticed is that it depends that, this, I don't know if I'd call it charisma, but there is a particular ability of particular directors to work with particular clients. So when I worked um, in one therapeutic community in the 1980s, where we primarily worked with violent boys, that depended on a particular director's style being really willing to front up to that. After he left, the violent boys tended to get discharged quite quickly, and they brought in much more self-harming girls because in the large community meetings, which were about 50 people in those days, there was, you know, the director felt much more able to manage that particular client group and to respond in a way that he felt comfortable with. That's interesting. Yeah. I was just, um, had some time to think about Christopher's question, and you also mentioned the veterans. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether one can compare <coughs> Northfield with a modern professional army. Well, as far as I know, the army in Northfield was not a professional <coughs> army as the British army is now. And I would say that <coughs> at Northfield, the army was still infused much more perhaps than today, this is a guess, with civilian value systems, which I would question a professional army today has, question mark. I don't know, but I think it, it, it is difficult to compare this. Angelica, who had been I'm not missing Rex's voice for the therapeutic community, but for me, you you told me about it. Hi, I'm here. I'm listening. <laughs> we seem to have to draw things to a close uh, and many themes that will no doubt be taken up in the large group which we will move on to after tea. Uh, thank you again to Diana.